Well, praise the Lord. God is good. So we've been on the, the armor of God and we've went through it a number of times. And I'm going to start about verse uh, 14. We're going to get to the sword this morning. We're going to talk about the sword of the Spirit. But I'm going to start in verse 14. He tells us to stand therefore. This is where he starts telling us about the armor. He says, stand therefore, uh, Ephesians 6, 14. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this time. We thank you for your holy word, for it is sharper than a double-edged sword, Father. And we just thank you for the sword of the Spirit that you've given us. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that you've given us. We just ask that you be over the time, that you be over everything said and done here today, that it bring honor and glory to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So today we get to the sword. And I, I, I don't know if some of y'all have seen it, but we watched, uh, me and Randy watched a show called Forged in Fire. And in this show, they, they make knives, they make all different kinds of things. Well, the one we watched a few weeks ago, they were making these swords. And they had to be sharp on both sides. They couldn't be too heavy. They had to be light. They had a certain specification they had to make these swords out of. And then it's a competition. You know, there's several guys there, and they, they had it down to these two men with, with the competition with these swords. And as they practiced different exercises with these swords, I, I watched and I thought about this message. I thought about, you know, what our sword is. It's not a physical sword that God has given us. The sword that God has given us is not a physical sword but it is a powerful sword that he has given us. And these swords, you know, this guy, they had a bag, and I mean sliced it open. They had this, this head that was like a, a jelly dummy, if you would. And they would stab the sword in it and see how easy it penetrated. This Bible right here will penetrate sharper than any sword. And this Bible will change your life if you will allow it to. And it will change the people's lives around you if you will allow it to. And since it's Father's Day, fathers, pay attention. Because this right here is what our children need. They need the Word of God. They need us to be godly men. They need us to carry the sword with us. And you know, uh, uh, since technology is coming so far, we've gotten out of the practice of carrying our Bibles with us when we go places. Well, I got it on my phone. I got it on my tablet. Yes, I use a tablet. Because it's easier than writing everything down now. i got notes, tablet, and the Bible and everything. But what we need to understand is that this is our lifeline. We all were born into this world. We all have to live through this life. And we all will face death. We all will face death on this earth unless the rapture takes place. Either way, we're going to face it. But where we're going to spend eternity... There ain't nobody on this earth can make that decision but you and you alone. Only you can make that decision of where you're going to spend the rest of your life. This, this is the only offensive weapon that we have in our armor of God. The other four pieces, the other five pieces, excuse me, the other five pieces are defensive. They're to protect you. This one is the one you fight with. And as we fight with it, we need to understand that this is a very important piece of our weapon. I mean, a piece of our armor. Because it is the only weapon we have of attack. Satan has one purpose and one purpose only. And that is to tear your life apart. Destroy you. It tells us John 10 to 10 says, The thief comes only to kill, to steal, and destroy. That's his purpose. It's to kill, steal, and destroy. And let me let, me in, let you in on a secret. And we're going to get to these verses here in a little while in Matthew chapter 4. But let me let you in on a secret. Satan knows God's Word. He knows God's Word better than you do. And he knows God's Word better than I do. But he does not know God's Word better than God does. Amen? So therefore, we need this Word because it's the Spirit of God that defeats Satan, not us. It's the Spirit of God inside of you 
that defeats Satan, okay? So our sword is the, is the what did it say on, in verse 17? What did he say? He says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So our sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. So in taking that, that's our only offensive part that we have in, in here to use. 2 Timothy 3 and 16 tells us this. All Scripture, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. I want to point out, point out that all Scripture is profitable. See, so many times we think that the Bible is Matthew to Revelation. We forget about Genesis to Malachi. Because that's Old Testament, right? We live by, we're not, we're not, we don't live by the law. We live by grace, right? We're in the New Testament church. We're the New Testament church. We live by grace, not, not by the old, the old law. So that is, in, but, but what we need to understand is God didn't give us 26 books or 28 books or 27 books. He gave us 66 books. Right. And there's a reason he gave us 66 books, so that we learn them. So that means that the book of Ezra, the book of Nehemiah, the book of Ecclesiastes, the book of Amos, the book of Micah, and the book of Obadiah. Lots of books that some of us Christians consider irrelevant, and many of us wouldn't even know where to find them. But they're relevant. They are relevant. Because scripture, all Scripture is profitable. There's nothing unprofitable in the entire Scripture. The purpose for which, we, for which they're given is stated in verse 17. Verse 7, 2 Timothy 3, 17 says this. That the man of God may be completely, may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Our completeness in our armor is the sword of the Spirit. We have our five pieces that are defensive. And then now we have our offensive part. This is how we fight our battles. This is how we fight our battles. See, the devil says you're defeated. You're torn up. You're destroyed. I got you. You can't do this. You, you think that you can do this. There's not a one of us in this room that has not felt that way one time or another in your life that Satan has talked down to you and you fell for his little scheme and his little trap. The dart came in, including myself, probably more than y'all. The little dart got through the shield. And we allowed that to happen. But what we need to understand is he says that the man of God, he tells us that all Scripture is God-breathed. Okay? And it's that the man of God can be completely may be complete. He may be thoroughly equipped with every good work. So, we are equipped. The, the man of God is equipped. And um, I believe that the Christians who are not acquainted with the whole Scripture cannot thoroughly equip because it's all there for his thorough equipment. There is no unimportant books in the Bible. Folks, we can't just live our life on John 3.16. We can't just live our life on... Uh, Romans 8 and 28. We can't just live our life on four or five verses. We've got to live our life on the inspired Word of God. We've got to live our life from Genesis to Revelation. We've got to start in the beginning, and we've got to end with Revelation, where, he, where we're going to be with Christ forever for eternity. And we've got to know the Word, because you cannot speak the Word properly if you do not know it. There's a few of y'all in here that are teachers. Some of you are retired, some of you are not. And you've taught students. And when you teach a student, you want them to do what? Learn, right? You want them to learn. Folks, we're God's students. He wants us to learn. He wants us to learn the Word of God. We need to have these verses when, the, when trials and tribulations come our way. Because there's going to come a time you may not have this book in your hand. You may not be able to open the book and flip to the verse and say, well, let me find it right quick. You may not have that. You, that's why David tells us in Psalms 119, hide your word in my heart, O God, that I might not sin against thee. You've got to put God's word inside of here. You've got to memorize scripture. I don't like the word memorize, but learn. You've got to learn scripture. Because scripture needs to be hid in our heart. What, what comes out, the Bible tells us, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What's coming out of your mouth? I had to catch myself a few times with my grandkids. Because some of the things coming out of my mouth, it's not slanderous, but you know what? It's not profitable. And it's not leading them to Christ. You don't call your grandkids bonehead. 
I learned that today. But you've got to understand that the things that we need to learn is God's Word. We've got to have our sword, folks, because Satan's coming. And we're going to talk about it here in just a minute about how he tempted Jesus. And you say, well, how can he tempt Jesus? Jesus is God's Son. Jesus is God's Son. And he was God's Son. He always is God's Son. But let me tell you something. When Jesus came to the earth, he left part of his deity. And he was fully God, but yet he was fully man. So he still was tempted just like we were tempted. That's why he, done, he went through everything that we could possibly go through. And, there, and the same is with us. So, 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. This is what Paul's telling, uh, Paul is telling to uh, Timothy right here. He says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom. Preach the word. There it is right there. You say, well, I'm not a preacher. Are you saved? Are you filled with the Holy Spirit of God? Then you're to speak the word. You may not be a person called to preach behind a pulpit, but you are to speak the word of God. He says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. There's where your scripture comes in. There's where you put that scripture inside of here. I don't care if you've got to write it on little sticky notes and stick it in your pickup or your car and start putting it on the doors at the house. Get this scripture in your heart. Get the word of God in your heart. He says, convince, uh, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires. We're kind of there right now, aren't we? But according to their own desires, because they have itchy ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you, meaning the elect, meaning those that are saved, but you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. We are to endure. We are to keep moving forward. Uh, we're going to give, uh, we got to be able to give an account of ourselves, our ministry, and our service to God one day. Because of this, what is the message that says? Preach the word. We preach the word of God. The uncompromised word. We don't add to it. We don't take away from it. You don't edit God's Word. You're not required to do that. Our job is to teach God's Word the way that it was written. We don't add to it. We don't take away from it. Because what does it tell us in Revelation? Jesus says, anyone that adds to or takes away from these words, you're out. So we don't add to God's Word. Don't put your thoughts. And that's what I always tell people. Is it's not about what I think. It's not about what you think. This is what God's Word says. Okay, don't put your thoughts, don't put you in the middle of God's word. Put God's word in the middle of you. Yes. That's what he wants. He wants you to put his word in the middle of you so that you can discern the things that are good and evil. So that you can discern these things and that you can move forward in God's kingdom. Hebrews 4 and 12 tells us this. For the word of God is living and powerful. This word is old. This word's been around for centuries. This word's been around a long time. But what does it say? It says, for the word of God is living and it's powerful. God's word is alive. What did Jesus tell the woman at the well? I've talked about this enough. Y'all ought to remember it. What did he tell the woman at the well? I'm the living water. He didn't say I'm the dead water. He said I'm the living water. Anyone who comes to me and thir that is thirsty may have drink. So, for the word of God is powerful. It's li it is living. It's powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. Piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. His word is living, it's powerful, it's sharper than a double-edged sword, it pierces even to the, to the division of your soul, and your spirit, and the joints and marrow of your body, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God's word can tell the, the intents of your heart. It'll tell you that it'll tell people the intent of your heart. It'll tell people what the, what, how you're how you're going to be, how you're going to treat folks, how you're going to live with things. You know, we, we read a few verses a while ago that talked about long suffering. We've got to be long suffering, and I'm going to tell you that's hard. When you've been praying for somebody for years, and you've been praying and praying and praying, and you haven't gotten an answer, and God hasn't answered you, and God hadn't changed this person's life, you get to the point you want to say, "I'm done." 
God, I'm done. You know what? They haven't changed in 20 years. I'm done. 25 years, God, they hadn't changed. 30 years, God, they haven't changed. What good is it? If I keep praying to you, and you're not going to answer my prayer. We get that way sometimes as human beings. But that ain't the way to be, is it? We are to stand firm. We are to preach the word in season and out of season. Exhort, rebuke, lift up. We have to have long suffering. We've got to be there for those that are lost, folks. We can't just give up on the world. Did God give up on us? He didn't give up on us, did He? So we can't give up on the lost world that's dying. Folks, we've got to be that example. And the one that's going to get in your way, and I've learned that this week, the one that's going to get in your way is not the one you're trying to minister to. The one that's going to get in your way is Satan. Because he don't want you to minister to the person that you're trying to minister to. Just like the story that Randy told about the gentleman she'd been going to the hospital and seeing. The devil don't want her to do that. The devil will say, you know what, let somebody else do that. Let somebody else go carry that load. That ain't your, that ain't your burden. You don't know them. Why would you go up there? That's how Satan works. And you know what? He's really good at it. He's really convincing, isn't he? He's really convincing because when you're tired and you've been at work all day and God's saying, I want you to go minister to this person and the devil's saying, you know what? Let somebody else do it. Okay. That's what we generally do. Okay. Because we don't want to do it. We don't want to move forward. But the Word of God is alive. It's energetic and it's sharper than any carnal material sword with two edges. It is the two-edged sword of, the, of our spiritual warfare. It's the double-edged sword of our spiritual warfare. It pierces to the innermost parts of human nature. When Jesus was on earth, he used his sword in conflict with Satan. And this is the meat of the message right here. I'm going to talk about the temptation that Satan, and Je that, uh, that Satan brought on Jesus Christ when he was in the desert. Because this is, a, this is not a story, folks. This is life. This is real. This is an event that happened. And, and our Savior, Jesus Christ... Defeated the enemy in the flesh, okay? He defeated him in the flesh. Not in his deity as the Son of God, but he defeated him in his flesh because he was fully God, but yet he was fully man, okay? So he defeated the enemy in his flesh. So let's go to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, we're going to start verse 1. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So, we know that the Spirit is the one that led Jesus into, this, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. It was God-led it was God -led because it said the Spirit, He was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. Verse 2, And when He had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterward, He was hungry. Folks, we got to pray. I've never talked a lot about fasting, but I'm going to tell you what. When you fast, you do something else. What is it? Pray. When you fast, you pray. Because you've got God on your mind. Jesus has been doing this for 40 days and 40 nights. He'd been fasting and praying. He'd been talking to the Father because he knew the temptation was coming. Yes, he was still fully God, so he knew the temptation was coming. But yet he was fully man to be able to be tempted. So he knew this was coming, so he was praying. When things is going on in your life, and the enemy is throwing these fiery darts at you. Are you fasting and praying? Are you seeking God in the things that is going on in your life? If your children's lost, are you sitting there seeking God for salvation for your children? Are you fasting and praying? Are you giving God a reason to say, Look, I hear your cry. And I will save your household. Are you giving Him a reason? We've got to be fasting. We've got to be praying. He did it for 40 days and 40 nights. I ain't asking you to do that because we ain't Jesus. We'd be dead after 40 days and 40 nights. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterward, he was hungry. Now, when the tempter, that is Satan, came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. He said, If you are. Well, come on now. Satan knows this is the Son of God. He knows that he's speaking to the Messiah. And this is what blows my mind right here. It's the Jews could not see Jesus Christ as the Messiah, but Satan did. Huh? These are, this is a man that's been cast out of heaven because he tried to become God. He knows that Jesus is the Son of God. But yet he believed and he knew this is the Son of God, but the Jews rejected him. I'm not saying that Satan accepted him, okay? But the Jews rejected him. 
He said, command these stones to become bread. But he answered, I want you to listen to this, because three times this is Jesus' sword. This is the sword of the Spirit being used right here by Christ. He says, but he answered and said, it is written. How many of us can answer the devil and say, it is written? We have to know the Scripture to do that, don't we? He says, but it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Well, you can't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. What was Jesus quoting? Deuteronomy. He was quoting the Old Testament to Satan. He was quoting Deuteronomy verses, chapter 8, verse 3. That's where that comes from. You might want to write that down. Deuteronomy 8 and 3. Because that's what Jesus quoted to him. See, he said, Satan used, he said, command these stones to become bread. He twisted it. He's twisting it. But what did Jesus say? He said, he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. See, Satan didn't put that part in, did he? He can twist the Scripture. He knows the truth. He knows the Scripture, but he can twist it. We have to have our swords, folks, which is the Word of God. We've got to have the sword to fight the battle because the battle's not against flesh and blood. It's against us, and it's against the enemy. And, if, and our attitude and how we live our everyday life, how we walk and how we deal. How many of you deal with stupid people? Everybody ought to raise your hand because everybody in here has dealt with stupid people. How many times have you been the stupid person somebody dealt with? Raise your hand. Huh? That's something else, isn't it? I get frustrated sometimes at work dealing with stupid people, and then I look in the mirror and I say, well, God, I'm sorry. Because I'm about as dumb as them sometimes. Sometimes. But you know what? We've got to get to that point in our life, folks, that we overlook flaws that people have so that we can get Christ to them. You hear what I said? We have to overlook flaws that some people have in order to get Christ to them. Because you know why? Because people have overlooked flaws that we have to get Christ to us. So we've got to get past us to see Christ. We've got to get past other people so they can see Christ. We've got to get that thing, we've got to get that relationship with us in Christ. Okay? Now, now comes the second temptation. He didn't get nowhere, did he? Satan didn't get nowhere on the first temptation, did he? So let's go to the second one, verse 5. It says, Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and, he, and said to him, If you are the Son of God. Come on now, devil. If you are, twice he said, if you are the Son of God, you know he is. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. Now listen to this closely. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Is that the scripture? Where does that come from? Where did them verses come from? Psalms 91, verse 11 and 12. Let's go over there and look at Psalms 91, 11 and 12. Verse 11, Psalms 91, 11. It says, for he shall give his angels charge over you. Isn't that what Satan said? Well, let's go back to over here to Matthew. He shall give his angels charge over you. So Satan quoted the right verse, didn't he? But he said, and in their hands they shall bear you up. Wait a minute. Verse 11 in Psalms 91, 1, uh, 91 11 says, For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Satan left that out. He didn't put in there to keep you in all your ways, did he? He said, all he said was he shall give his angels charge over you. He didn't say to keep you in all your ways. Not some of your ways, not part of your ways, but to keep you in all your ways. That's what Christ said. Christ said that he knows the word, and he spoke the word to Satan. He said that he will keep you in all your ways. Verse 12. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. That's verse 12 of Psalms 91. But, and then here's Jesus' reply to the enemy. Jesus, verse 7, Matthew 7. Jesus said to him, It is written again. It is written again. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, he quoted scripture. Where's that verse out of? Deuteronomy. 
6 and verse 16. I didn't know these. I had to look them up, so don't think I'm smart. But that's out of Deuteronomy 6 and 16. Twice out of Deuteronomy, Jesus quoted verses to Satan. Satan twisted it. Jesus put it back on him. You see what the importance of your sword is? Do you see what the importance of the Spirit of the Word of God is? That you may speak boldly to the enemy in truth and speak to him that he is defeated. Now let's go to the third temptation. It says, verse 8. It says, again, the devil took him on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Did he have that authority? No. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. He did have that authority. Let's go back to uh, flip over to John 12 and 31, Ridge, and do the NIV. He is the prince of this world. Satan has control of this world for a time, folks. Right now, he's in charge. He had the right to, get, to give that to Jesus. But what did Jesus tell him? He says, then Jesus said to him, away from you, away with you, Satan, for it is written. The third time Jesus said, it is written. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. He said, I don't want your kingdom. I don't want what you're sitting here and putting out before me. I don't need these things. Because my kingdom is greater than what you have to offer. Because I am of the Father, and the Father is of me. I and the Father are one. So Jesus rejected Satan. Jesus rejected him in the flesh. If Jesus can resist the devil in the flesh, can we? Can we do it? With his help. With his help. There you go. By the Spirit that dwells inside of us, yes, we can. By the Spirit of God that dwells in our hearts, yes, we can defeat, defeat the enemy. But you cannot do it by yourself. That's why you need the offensive part of your armor, which is God's Word, which is the sword of the Spirit. You have to have the Spirit of God inside of you, and you've got to have the power of the Word of God inside of you so that you can speak boldly to the enemy as Jesus did. And then you can resist him. It tells us in James to resist the devil and he will flee from you. Well, when you resist him and he flees from you, it's because the Spirit of God inside of you speaks to him. And tells him, not today. You're defeated in the name of Jesus. Get out. So we need to understand that these temptations did not cause our Savior to fail. Verse 11, it says, Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Three times. Three times Satan tried to destroy Jesus. He tried to get him at his lowest moment. He was weak. He hadn't had any food. His physical body was weak. Forty days and forty nights he had fasted. But not only was he weak from not having any food or having anything. He was strong because he had his time with, with the Father prayer. Yes. And we'll get into that next week about the prayer because that's the seventh part of the armor. See, we think there's only six. We think that the sword's the last piece, but it's not. Prayer is the last piece. Because God's number of completeness is seven. His number of completeness is seven. But the sword is our weapon, folks. It's our weapon not to use against people. But it's our weapon to use against Satan. And God says, I've given you 66 books full of swords. Full of swords that you can use. In any situation. I've heard this my whole life. That God didn't give us no manual how to raise kids. Yes, He did. He gave you 66 books on how to raise children. And if we would have started in this at a young age before we had kids and learned this word, then you know what? Maybe our kids would be different today. Maybe we wouldn't have to be on our knees praying and asking God to save them because they'd already been saved. And I'm not putting the blame on us. I'm just saying this is something we should have done differently. We should have been in this when we were younger. But we need to get the word of God out to a lost and dying world, folks. We've got to get it out. And then close it. I'm going to close with this last one. And if, uh, back to uh, verse 10. When Jesus said, Away with you, Satan, it is written, You shall not, you shall worship the Lord God and him only. That's Deuteronomy 6 in verse 13. That's what, it, what Jesus was quoting there is Deuteronomy 6 and 13. So all three he, vote, uh, he, he quoted was out of Deuteronomy. 
out of Deuteronomy 8 and out of Deuteronomy 6 was the three times that he quoted to Satan. In closing, Isaiah 55 and 11 says this. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. God said his word's not going to come back to him void. It's going to accomplish what he pleases, and it shall prosper in the thing that he sent it. God's word cannot fail. It cannot fail. It always accomplishes the purpose of God. Okay? But there's one very important qualification in that verse that I want to point out. That a lot of preachers miss this. And I've missed it before myself. But a lot of preachers miss this. God says, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It's not just God's word. It's God's word out of God's mouth that cannot fail. It's God's word out of God's mouth that will not fail. You can never separate the word from the mouth that it comes out of, can you? And that's why it is out of God's mouth. Because when God's mouth speaks, it's God's breath that goes with it. And God's breath is the Spirit. It's the word with the Spirit in it that will never return to Him void. Amen? It's the word with the Spirit that will never return to our Father void. The word without the Spirit, Scripture says this in 2 2 Corinthians 3 and 6. The word without the Spirit Spirit says it is dead. The letter kills, 2 Corinthians 3, 6, but the Spirit gives life. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Folks, we have life, and we have it more abundantly. Jesus, the second part of 10, it says the thief, uh, John 10, 10. It says the thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. But see, I didn't read the second part of that to you. The second part of that, it says, but I have come, I, meaning Christ, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. That abundant life starts, for, starts when your eternity starts. Your eternity starts when you accept Jesus Christ, your Savior. So that abundant life is now. You say, well, if this is abundant life, man, what's heaven going to be like? It's going to be better than this. But your abundant life started when you become a child of God. Your abundant life started when etern- your eternity began with Jesus. So, get your sword this week. Open it up. Look into it. Memorize some verses. Don't memorize just John 3.16. Get some other verses in your heart. Get some of these other verses that you can fight against the enemy. What does it tell us in Philippians 4 and 13? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I can do all things, not through what I do. I do all things through what you do. No, it says I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So get, these, get this word in your heart. Don't let Satan twist it to you because he's going to want to. Satan will sit there and he'll get in your head and he'll twist this word to the point that you'll start listening to preachers out there that are twisting the word and you'll be listening to it and, you, and you'll believe it. Because Satan will put that out there for you. Know the word so you can discern the word. Know the word so you can discern what people are talking about you. And when you hear false teaching, don't pay attention to it. Get away from it. Only Endure through sound doctrine. That's what it said. Preach the word. Sound doctrine. Get this word in your heart so that you can use your sword to defeat the enemy, which is Satan. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your holy word. Thank you, Father, that you didn't leave us with just five pieces of armor that are defensive and not give us an offensive piece. You gave us a sword to use. You gave us a sword to fight. Father, you're coming back at the battle of Armageddon in the book of Revelation. You said that you're coming back with a double-edged sword coming out of your mouth. And that double-edged sword is your word. That double-edged sword is what's right here in this book. It is the word of God. And you're going to smite the nations. You're going to destroy nations by speaking the word of God. Father, we can do the same. You said greater things that Jesus said greater things that you do than I did because I'm going to be with the Father. We can do the same thing if we will quote the Word of God and not misuse it, not misquote it, but learn it, hide it in our hearts, have it ready to defeat Satan. Let us not be trying to fight each other. Let us fight the real enemy, which is the devil. Because the devil is the one that the battle's against. 
And Lord, we can't quit. We're in a war. And we can't be. There, there's no room for weakness in war. So Father, we have to be strong. And, 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 and in your might. And put on the whole armor of God. That we may defeat the enemy. As we battle him. On our everyday basis. Because he'll show up. He may show up when we walk out that door. It may be in the morning before he shows up. But he is going to show up. But Jesus, you tell us that we can defeat him with your holy word. And it's through the spirit of God that dwells, dwells inside of us that, does the, that actually defeats him. So Holy Spirit, I pray today that you take over each and every one of us this week. That you come inside of us and fill us. Because upon salvation, you come inside of us. But the filling of the Spirit comes when we are in tune with God. So I pray for us to be filled with the Spirit of God this week. So when circumstances come, when trials come, and they will. But up for us to be of good cheer because Christ has overcome the world. And if Christ has overcome the world and Christ is in me and Christ is in you, what has happened? We have overcome the world through Christ. Through Christ our Savior. So, Father, I pray this week that we will learn this word. We will study this word. We will hide this word in our heart. We will use this word to defeat the enemy. And let us not give up because the final part of our, our armor is coming up next week. The power of prayer. A spirit-led prayer life. Father, we thank you and we give you glory. And it's in the holy name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen.